Okay, once again, happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to Tippecanoe Bible Church. Uh, just to kind of review what, what Keller covered, um, for the, our, the 20th of December, we're meeting at Pizza Hut, which is over there on 26th Street next to the post office. We have that, reserve that room just to the left as you go in. We can get all of you in, plus some in there. So it's all going to be covered. If you come, this is your first time coming to church or whatever, everybody's welcome to come to this. We'll just have a good time a bunch of variety of pizzas and a salad bar they have uh, fruits uh, in the salad bar also so there's plenty there to offer but go ahead come enjoy it with us I'll have a little game that we can play questions and stuff but it, it just it just be a good time to get together so we want to do that to show we appreciate all that you've done now this ministry meeting that I'm having anybody involved in a ministry or anybody that comes to the church can attend this but I just want to go over some things that just to be aware when you're in a ministry of what you have to understand to be part of serving in ministry, whether you're a greeter, whether you do junior church, whether you're in a nursery, whether you get up here and speak, whether you teach a class, whatever, being in a the ministry, there's some things that we all should know before we actually get involved. So I just want to kind of go over that with everybody. And so make sure that if you're in a ministry of any type here at our church, that you make sure you attend this meeting. If you can't attend it on the 5th at 7, um, we will go ahead and I'll schedule another time that I can meet with you sometime and, and we'll go over it. With, like with Keller, can't be here because he's going to be um, with his family. So, But if anybody can't make it and you're in a ministry, let's set up a separate time where I can go over this stuff with you. It's only about a half hour, but it's good for stuff for us all to know. Okay, as you know, we're in the book of Revelation. Uh, today we have four more messages, so we're getting close. I hope to finish, we'll finish this December 15th, but today we're going to cover these five verses in Revelation chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there, and we're, this whole series we're calling the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Today we're talking about end time prophecy is unsealed. The book of Revelation is the book of Revelation. What does that mean? Revealing, the revealing of Jesus Christ. So, we need to know this book, we need to understand it. And I think more so today that we need to understand this than we ever have in past history. Because we're getting closer and closer to that time when Jesus Christ will return. This week, most of you will, uh, if not all of you, will you stick a turkey in the oven, right? And you'll set that oven on the time for the ding when that turkey's done. And actually before that, you have your turkey in the uh, refrigerator and a few days before it on thaw, it takes a couple days to thaw, right? Depending on the size of the turkey. So everything works on time. You have that time to do that. When you go to work, you got to get to work at a certain time. You go on break, you go on lunch. You, your end of your day um, work ends at a certain time. And if you're lucky, you get to go home unless you say, you got to stay late. But we all work on a clock. We have time stamps. We have kindergarten, uh, middle school. Then you go to high school. Then you go to college. And it's all basically set up for your life that you go through these different timestamps or markers. You get married, you may have children, you get promoted at work, and then eventually you retire. And who would ever think that retirement, you were ever going to reach it? Remember when you were working, some of you that have retired, when you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s? That day is never going to come. But before you know it, it's there, right? It just happens. It's funny how life is. Um, so we go through these timestamps. And... End time prophecy I'm going to talk about today. Now, I was told last week that I was too negative sometimes. And I'm thinking too negative in teaching the book of Revelation. You read Revelation 6 through Revelation 19 and just read it, read it and take it literally. What do you think it's talking about? It's talking about what's going to happen in this world when God pours out his wrath in this world. How can I candy coat that? I, I just have a hard time doing that. I, I, I'm not trying to be too negative. I, I think the truth is, the real truth is I'm too positive. Honestly, think about it. I'm too positive. We're in our postmodern society and we reject truth. We have this relativism. Well, that, what's true for you is not true for me. You know what? You're going to find out that when we stand in front of Jesus Christ that what's true for, for you is true for me because Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So I am positive that truth will prevail. Here's some things that I'm positive about. The Bible is true. I believe the Bible is God's word. He wrote it for us. It's true and we should know it. And the book of Revelation is written for us to understand it. Something else, I'm going to tell you that's true. Now, this is part of my being negative. We're all going to die. Right? I'm going to die. Every one of us is going to die eventually. It's going to, it happens. It comes just like that. 
And I'm not saying that to be negative, but I'm telling you, you need to come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior before it's too late, because someday, before you know it, it's going to be over. It is. Now, the third thing that I'm going to tell you that is 100% true, Jesus is coming back. He is coming back, people. He really is. I mean, this is not some kind of fairy tale that I'm telling you. I'm telling you, honest to God, truth from God's word, Jesus is coming back to this earth, and we better understand that. First, he's going to come for his church to take us to home before that tribulation starts. At the end of that seven-year tribulation, he's coming back to this world. He's setting up his kingdom. I, we need to understand this stuff. This is going to happen. Now, we sit there and think, well, la, 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 it's not going to happen until later on or sometime or whatever. It's going to happen sometime to some people that are alive in this earth. And I believe we may be the people on this earth that it's going to happen when he comes back for that rapture of the church. We need to understand that and be ready. I'm going to look at Isaiah 46, verse 11 real quick before we get started. Because I want to tell you what it says in the Old Testament. Just one verse. Isaiah 46, verse 11. And this is Jesus, or God, basically using animals, using people to complete his purpose. He says here, Calling a ravenous bird from the east, a man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yeah, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God says he's going to do what he's going to do, and he's going to do it. Isaiah 46, 11 is true, and it's going to, the Bible is going to be fulfilled. This stuff's going to happen. This is not something that, you know, we just go to church for just to, for to go to church. This stuff is true. It's truth. It's not relative. It is an absolute. So we have something to think about. So today, I want us to look at this by starting off in Revelation 22, verse 6. If you'd turn there, please, in your Bibles. Now, for some reason, my ma mind is not clicking today. I, I notice that, but sometimes that happens, right? We, sometimes we just, but we, let's do the best we can to go through this and understand this the best we possibly can, because this is God's Word. This is the end of the book of Revelation. This is the end of God's book, the Bible. We need to understand what he's saying. Don't, whenever you watch a show, isn't it the last five minutes where you, it, everything comes together and you understand it, you know? So this is true about the Bible, true. So let's look at verse 6 of Revelation chapter 2, chapter 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, this is being told John, the apostle. Remember, he's on the island of Patmos. He got taken up to heaven, and he's revealed all this here. And he said, said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. By the way, that word shortly there is the word takos, not tacos, takos. Takos is like a tachometer on your car, you know. I remember when I first got a car, I got this Ford Mustang, and, and I was kind of an idiot the way I drove that car. I'm surprised I'm still here today, but I always like to press on the gas pedal and go as fast as I could. Dumb. Kids can be dumb, can't they? But God spares us for the things we do. But that's the word where we get the word tachometer. It says shortly be done. You know what that means? It means it goes faster, 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 accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. That's what that word means. And I'm going to talk about this a little more as we go through this. So he said there, you notice the three bullet points on the screen. These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now, faithful and true. Is there anything today that we can say for sure it is faithful and true? Now, we all may like a certain news network, and others like us on other news network, and I'm not 100% sure we can trust any news network completely, right? It, you got to be careful about that. And you, the things you hear, you got to be careful with. I think the only thing we can know for sure is God's Word. And we got to realize that. But it says the Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent his angel to real, reveal this to the Apostle John, the book of Revelation. So Revelation 1.1 1, 1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, this is God's message to the churches. Now, we know we read in chapter 2 and 3 about these seven churches, right? Different types of churches. Well, them churches exist today, you know, and I believe truly we're in what's called the, the last church, the seventh church, Church of Laodicea, the Church of People's Rights, where they do whatever they want. But I tell you, this was written to the churches, that means us, you and I, all saved believers, people that have trusted Christ as Savior, this book is written for us. And it says here that to show unto his servants, servants is doulos. You know what that means? It means we are God's slaves in a sense, and we're to follow him and obey him. And it's, it's important we understand that. But it says, which must shortly be done, takosk, 
means quickly. Like I said, tachometer. I remember as a kid, I was in Boy Scouts, and we have this thing called the Soapbox Derby, I think it was called, and our troop and other troops would all get together, and there's a big hill in a town that I grew up in, and we'd get up on this ramp and it'd release you and get to go down the hill. And I was chosen for our group, maybe because of my size at that time or weight or something. I don't know why. But all I had to do was steer this thing, okay, to keep it straight. So I think I came in fifth place out of how many, I don't know. I didn't do that great. But basically, I'm just sitting in this little wooden car with wheels on it with a steering wheel. And so went down the hill. But I did notice one thing. I went faster and faster and faster and faster. I started to accelerate as you're going down the hill. And that's the idea of this word quickly or talk tacos. It means things occur faster and faster and faster. If you were to study prophecy back 100 years ago and see what's going on, maybe every five years, 10 years, something would happen. Then every 50 years, you, I mean, back 50 years ago, it was maybe a little faster, but then last 10 years, last five years. And I'll tell you this last year, this last month, and this last week, things have accelerated. Things are happening so much. And if you know anything about the Bible, I'm going to tell you, and I d hate to be one of these guys that say, like a, people that stand up in a mountain with a white robe and say, Jesus is coming back, but he's coming back. And I believe we're that close. Um, I've mentioned this guy's name before, Andy Woods. Andy Woods ends with an S. He has a series that he does every week. He's, got a, he's a pastor of a church down in Sugarland, Texas. And on YouTube, you can find him. Just look up Andy Woods with an S. And he does this series called um, Pastor's Point of View. And I haven't watched this maybe for a month or so. And I watched it yesterday. PPOV, Pastor's Point of View, number two, 329. And it was amazing. I couldn't believe how so much has changed over these last month or so. And he's talking about Russia and Iran and Turkey. And if you know anything about Ezekiel 38, they've proven that these are the nations that are, that are talked about that's going to have something instrumental in the last days as far as attacking Israel and so on. And what's being fulfilled with all three of these countries. If you get a chance, look that up. Andy Woods on YouTube and look up his pastor's point of view and watch that one, 329. It, it's pretty amazing. It really is. And he talked about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of these countries that doesn't attack Israel in the last days because there's a treaty signed with him. It's a covenant. And, our, and we see that um, Donald Trump, who's going to be coming to president on January 20th, less than two months away, he picked this guy as a secretary of defense named Pete Hegseth. And this guy loves Israel. He, he's pro-Israel. He's already working with Robbie Chaim Richmond in Israel. And this rabbi talking about, we got to get that third temple built. There's going to be a third temple because it tells us in the book of Revelation that that third temple is going to, Antichrist is going to go in there and call himself God at the middle of the tribulation. We studied that a little bit on Thursday night. But isn't that interesting? We, we, we talk about Donald Trump. We say he's going to slow things down as far as um, us going into this tribulation and so on. You know, because our country's not going to be so wicked. But I think he's going to be used for a lot of these things to fulfill them. And by choosing this guy and getting that temple built, now they've got to solve that problem of Islam and the Dome of the Rock and so on. But maybe Donald Trump is the one that can do this. I tell you what's happening right now. Our lame duck president, who's going out of office, looks like he's kind of trying to start a war with Russia, doesn't he? And so I'll tell you, it's... it's it's interesting what goes on in the political science scene to understand what this is all about. But hey, I'll tell you what, he is, this stuff is happening. It's coming to fruitation. It's going to be true. So as I said here, um, show unto his servants the things that which must shortly come to pass. It's going to happen. It's impending. The clock is ticking. So that's Revelation 22 verse 6. I want to take us back to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And this is kind of interesting because Revelation 1.1 1, 1, is very similar to Revelation 2.6, and I've got it on the screen. In Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, we can compare this with chapter 22, verse 6. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is revealing Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, we are his servants, things that which must shortly come to pass. Back there in Revelation 1, verse 1, that's the word takas again. It means faster and faster, things which come to pass. And he sent and signified it. That means signs, make it known. You've all heard the song, signed, sealed, and delivered, right? Jesus, it's, it's signed, sealed, and delivered by his angel onto his servant. And so we see the start of this book, the end of this book. You know, the start of the book is called a prologue. End of a book is called an epilogue. And so we see the beginning, the prologue, the ending, the epilogue, shows cohesion and rationality 
of this book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. This book can only be written by God. It's an amazing book. When you talk about how much of the Old Testament is in this book of Revelation, I mean, there's, there's more than 400 things that you can go into Old Testament and say it's talked about in the book of Revelation. I mean, some people have made a big list of these, but that are alluded to in the book of Revelation. It is an amazing book. It's just fascinating. And so this book was inspired by God. It was God breathed. It was put together. And we need to understand this book. So let's go ahead, go on to verse 7 of Revelation chapter 22. And this is Jesus speaking, okay? In most of your Bibles, you probably have red letters there. Um, Jesus is speaking in Revelation chapter 22. It's funny how he comes on and he starts injecting his thought into Revelation 22. And he does it in verse 7. We'll see in verse 12 next week, verse 13, verse 16, and verse 20. So let's look at verse 7. It says here, Behold, I come quickly. What do you think that word quickly is? That's the word takos again. Accelerates. Blessed is he that keeps the saying of the prophecy of this book. What is Jesus telling us to do? Keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Find out what this book is all talking about. I hear my very last message on the book of Revelation is going to be kind of, I'm going to wrap up, put everything together. And I'm thinking of titling it maybe the book of Revelation made practical. I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then, which talks about, read this book. Revelation 22 verse 7, which is the verse 1, says keep the sayings of this book. Then in verse 10 it says unseal this book. It should be unsealed and known. And we're going to talk about how this book should be practical in your life. Okay, so for my last message there on December 15th, I hope. So here, he says, behold, I come quickly. Throughout this last chapter, Jesus personally injects what he needs to say. And he says it in these verses that I just mentioned. And it says, blessed is he that keeps. Keeps, you do something, that's obedience, isn't it? It's so sad that there's so much lack of obedience in Christianity today. People live as they please. In fact, that's what the church of Laodicea means. The church of people's rights. They do what they want, you know, in the last days. But it says, blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I th believe that's talking about Revelation. And as we look at verse uh, 18 and 19 uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to see, I think this talks about the whole Bible. The whole Bible is... We, we're not to change it, add to it. We're not to take anything out of it. We're to take God's word for what it says. And so in verse 3, as I mentioned, he says this back in ch chapter 1. Now, we just talked about how verse 1 relates to verse 6 of chapter 22. Here I'm going to talk about uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, how it relates to Revelation 22, verse 7. So it says here, verse 3 in chapter 1, Blessed is he that reads... When you read something, you should know it, right? Do you ever read something you say, I gotta go back then and read it because my mind was kind of blank and I started daydreaming. And you go back and read it, you go back and read it. And tell, but blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. It's near, it's imminent, it's gonna happen. We're to read it, we're to understand it, we're to obey it. He's coming back. The question is, are you living for him? If you know Jesus Christ was coming coming back tomorrow, you'd all of a sudden get all sanctified, wouldn't you? Or holy. If you knew he was coming back in a week, you probably would. Or in a month. But sometimes we think, I can go ahead and live as I please and do what I want, because Jesus might not be coming back for another six months, a year, two years, ten years. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong way of thinking. We've got to realize he could come back any time. And your life matters how you live as a Christian. Not to be saved. Salvation is based on one thing. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone for all eternity. But at how you live is very important because you want to live to, because you love Him, right? So back in the Old Testament, I'm going to give you a verse. The book of Daniel is called the Apocalypse of the Old Testament, okay? The book of Revelation is called the Apocalypse of the New Testament, the Revealing. We should have went through the book of Daniel first, then the book of Revelation, because as you understand the book of Daniel, you really understand the book of Revelation. But on December 5th, in two weeks, I'm going to cover Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. You want to see something that's absolutely fascinating, come out on, on uh, December, December 5th for that message uh, Thursday night at 6 p.m., and I'm going to cover that. But back in Daniel 8:26, which... Daniel, remember he back in about 600 B.C., he wrote the book of Daniel somewhere around 540 B.C. He didn't tell exactly, but it's somewhere around that time period, which for you and I was 2,500 years ago, by the way. And it's an amazing book. But Daniel was told this. He, he received a vision in Daniel 8.26. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which is told, is true. Doesn't that sound like 
Revelation 1, 6, where it said it's true, and even Revelation 22, 6. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. What does God tell? He says, I'm giving you a vision, but you're not to understand this vision yet. Not for many days. When is that many days? I think that's what's referred to as the last days. I believe we're here today. I think we're studying, as we study the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel today, we see things so much more than somebody did 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Back 100 years ago, they were asking, well, is Israel really ever going to go back in the land? Yet in 1948, they did. And there's so much being fulfilled of the Bible prophecy that it's absolutely amazing. So I think in these two verses, uh, Revelation 22, verse 6, Revelation 22, verse 7, that there is an urgency. It's a matter of life and death. And that life and death is basically, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you're going to spend eternity separated from God in the lake of fire. And I hope you're all paying attention to understand that. And if you trust Christ as Savior, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. So place your faith in Christ as you can. You know, trust him right now so that you can know for sure you're going to heaven. It's extremely important. Now I'm going to look back at 2 Peter chapter 3 real quick. And I'll read these two. If you want to turn back there with me, you can. Now after Jason finishes his study on the full armor of God, I'm going to teach 2 Peter on Thursday nights. But 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 3 through 13. And listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, in other words, this is what you should know first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Do we have scoffers today? Right? And then verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, at least they believe in creation. And verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant. You think people are willingly ignorant? They don't even want to know what this book says? Put my head in the sand. I don't want to hear it. Blah, blah, blah. Right? That's willingly ignorant. Of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The world was created. It was in water. The land came and he shaped it. And then verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. You know Noah's, Noah's ark, the flood that came upon the world. It's talked about there. And there's so much archaeological evidence for all this, if you really look into it. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, serve unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. A thousand years doesn't mean much to God really, right, does it? And we have to understand that. So when we look and say, well, where's Jesus? When is he coming back? Well, he's coming back, and I think it's getting closer and closer. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the Greek word metanoia. It means to change your mind. I used to think I could earn myself my way to heaven. Now I understand it's only through Jesus Christ I trust him. That's what the word repentance means. It means change your mind of what you believe to the truth, okay? It doesn't mean turn from your sins. Religion has taught people that repentance means turn from your sins. That would be add works to salvation, by the way, and it really would be. So here, in verse 10, but the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord starts at the rapture, and it ends at the end of the millennial kingdom. It's approximately 1,007 years of, of long, okay? So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. Now, when a thief comes in the nighttime, he doesn't ring your doorbell, does he? He doesn't call you beforehand and say, I'm going to come break into your house and I'm going to steal some stuff. No, come, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to come and he's going to be here like that when he takes us to heaven. That's the day of the Lord. The rapture starts the day of the Lord. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, talking about after the millennial kingdom, uh, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and good, goodliness? That word conversation, an old English word, just think of the three letters there, C-O-N, con, it means conduct. Conversation, when we see it in the old King James, it means conduct, your behavior. And then verse 12, looking for and hasting. I'm going to come back and tell you that word hasting in just a second. Unto the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall be melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless... We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Right now, this world doesn't dwell in righteousness, does it? I mean, it's pretty corrupt. But here's the thing. That word for hasting there in verse 12 
of 2 Peter chapter 3, that's where we get our word speed, and it's the word spudo. It really means to desire earnestly. So looking for and desiring earnestly unto the coming of the day of God. I want him to come back. But if he wants to leave me here for a while, that's his choice. But I, I'm not going to complain when he comes back and gets me at the rapture of the church. Not at all. So it says the day of God there. Now there's three things that are synonymous. The day of God, the day of Christ, and the day of the Lord. They all basically mean the same thing. That Jesus Christ is going to come back for the church, rapture us to heaven. Then shortly after that, the seven-year tribulation will start, which is Revelation 6 through 19. After that, as Revelation 20 says in, in the Old Testament, I, uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 talks about the millennial kingdom. That's going to be a thousand years on this earth. After that, you're going to have the great white throne judgment where all the unsaved people come before Christ and get judged and get cast in the lake of fire. So that day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the day of God lasts approximately 1,007 years. That makes sense? So everybody starts at the rapture, it ends at the great white throne judgment after the millennial kingdom. Now, I found it interesting in Philippians 1.6, it talks about the day of Christ and how God is working in you. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, We may be sincere and excellent and have discernment. In Philippians 2, verse 16, As the day of Christ approaches, your labor is not in vain. Everything you do is not in vain. It amounts to something. Now, last week we looked at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. And we've seen that the Thessalonian Christians thought they were already in the day of Christ. They already thought they were in the tribulation. Somebody lied to them, and Paul had to go straighten them out. No, no, not yet. First, there's got to be a rapture, and then there's got to be an antichrist. So we covered that last Thursday. But you see this all over the place in the Bible, that this day of Lord, day of Christ, and day of God, it's that time period that starts with the rapture, and it ends with the end of the millennial kingdom. So, as I mentioned, it's 1,007 years old. So back to Revelation chapter 22. Let's look at verse 8. So verse 8, if I can get there, in chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, it says this, And I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. You notice that... This was overwhelming for John as he saw these things. He says, I, John, saw these things and heard them. So John was cognizant of what he saw and heard. He said, this is amazing. And he had that spatial awareness of where he was at, that he was in heaven. God was really being all this stuff to him, and it was too much for him. How would you be? If you've seen all this stuff in the book of Revelation, God showed you a preview picture of what's happening and John was too much, he fell down before the feet of an angel. Now, you know we're not supposed to worship angels, right? Not at all. And so he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. And he wasn't supposed to do that, but he was overwhelmed by what he saw there at that angel that he saw. It, it was just too much for him, he fell down. Now, if you remember back in Revelation 19.10, he, he did this again, or be, previously, he says, I fell at the, his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See, you do it not. I am your fellow servant, and of your brother that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So he was told, don't fall down at the feet of an angel. Now, if an angel appeared to me, and angels are pretty powerful, I, I don't know. I hopefully wouldn't. I think I'd respect them, but we're not supposed to fall down and worship them. Back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, Jesus, when um, John was with Jesus there, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now remember, John was the youngest of the disciples, and he was with Jesus as a disciple, and here we are, what, 70 years later, approximately, and now he sees Jesus again, and he sees who Jesus really is, and he fell down at his feet. Now this is, this, it's okay to fall at the feet of Jesus. I can't wait. I will have no problem falling at the feet of Jesus. In fact, I probably won't be able to help myself because it says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. It's okay to fall at the feet of Jesus. He is the spirit of prophecy. He's the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy. He's the record of prophecy. He is all about prophecy. Now I'll tell you what, if an unsaved person looks at the book of Revelation and reads it and they say, I can't understand this. It makes no sense. Even an immature baby Christian reads the book of Revelation 
They're going to have a hard time understanding it. But as you grow, as you study, as you put things together, the Holy Spirit helps you to understand this book. And I try the best I can to teach it as clear and as simple as I can, and I hope we all understand it. But it's a wonderful book to really take the time and try to understand it. So let's look at verse 9 here in chapter 22. And it says in verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and thy brother and the prophets, of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So John was told, worship God, not an angel. Just like when Revelation 19.10, he fell down at his feet. Here he does it again. He, keeps, he gets overwhelmed, and I can't criticize him for that, because I'm not sure what would happen to me if I was there. But he says, see you do it not. I'm your fellow servant of your brother and the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. I think this really was an angel. Some people think this was a, because the angel, means, the word means messenger, that it was some other messenger. But I think as mentioned earlier, this is an angel that's revealing this to the Apostle John. Just like in the book of Daniel, we had Michael the archangel, we had Gabriel come to, to, come to uh, Daniel and, and give him information. I think here that we see this angel came to John and he tells him, he says, worship God. This is a command. You and I have to be very careful about what we make idols, right? People make many things idols and they tend to worship. And, and we got to be careful about that. We're to worship God and God only. Back in John 4.24, what, about 70 years early, the Apostle John wrote this. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, it's important to be sincere, right? But if you're sincerely wrong, is that any good? You have to be careful about that. Um, it's not a substitute for spirit and truth. It's not when we worship or where we worship or how we worship or so on. It's really you worshiping internally because you respect God, you love God, and you worship Him spirit and in truth. So there's a lot of people that will get up and do a lot of things and it looks like they're worshiping God, but they're just showing emotion. Now there's nothing wrong with having emotion, is there? Um, but worship really in the Bible is an act of homage or reverence by, by kneeling or prostration, that's what it means. It's not emotion. Now, you may get emotional. I get emotional sometimes thinking about all this in God's Word. But it's true understanding of who God is and our desire to truly obey Him. That's true worship. Obeying Him and listening to what He says and understanding God's Word and worshiping because who He is. So in verse 10, we see in Revelation 22, it tells us this. And He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Notice it says the time is at hand there again. Now, on the bullet point, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. We need to read this book. We need to know this book. The time is at hand. It's near. Now, we're almost ended, Revela uh, not Revelation, but, but 2025, right? What, just over a month and a, a week? We'll be there. Um, and people will say, could Jesus, could, be at a, could it be another 100 years before he comes back? I've got a good friend that's a Christian that thinks that he's probably not coming back for 100 years, 200 years, so on and so on. I don't think so. I honestly, this is what I think. I think, using my analogy of the soapbox derby, that we're at the bottom of that hill. I really do think that that's, we're that close. <laughs> Why do people always want to push it off? Why do one of people not think that Christ has come back? He's going to come back for a group of believers, and it could be us. That's the most amazing thing in the world. Do you remember when Jesus was born, hardly anybody was there at his birth? They basically ignored what the Bible actually said, and there's only a few people that showed up. In fact, all those in Jerusalem said, yeah, he's supposed to be born down there in Bethlehem somewhere, and they didn't go, they didn't care. We are not to be that way. Keep this on your mind that, hey, it's important to realize he could come back any time. Always have that in the forefront of your mind, thinking that Jesus could come back, if not today, tomorrow, next week, next year. It's, it's going to happen, and it could be happening very soon. Back in Daniel, chapter 12, Daniel received this vision, and this is what he told. I kind of covered a little bit of this already. But Daniel 12, 4, it says, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Daniel was told to seal the book. We're told to unseal it. Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Sometime that end has to come. And I think this end is getting closer and closer. Many shall run true and flow. Don't people run true, true and fro right now? We're so busy, we can go anywhere we want, whenever we want, do all this stuff. And really, church becomes only if it's a convenient. I'll go to church if I've got nothing else going on. If my little toe don't hurt, then I'll go to church. 
uh, blah, 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 if I'm not doing this. And they make church only a convenience. But church should be the first primary thing you should do to go to church to worship God together. You do know that the Bible says that the local church is God's ordained institution, and we will be part of that. And it's an honor to come to church and to worship him and serve him. And I'm so thankful for you people. You guys are so faithful. And we want to show that in our Christmas party that, hey, this is for you guys it's just because you guys have done so much and helped us so much with this church, all of us working together in unity. But notice it says, and knowledge shall be increased. You think we're there. Do you have that little cell phone thing that you pick up? You can, you can put in there and understand, learn anything. Google, AI, so on, so on. I mean, it's, it's amazing that knowledge shall be increased. And it's like we can know anything now that we could. Before, you'd have to go to the library and look up all these books, right? And it, it's just a, it's amazing how this has all increased so much. They talk about um, the increase in knowledge, how it just doubles every couple of years. And now it's every six months or so or whatever. But it just, knowledge is increasing so much. But isn't it interesting that Daniel, back in 500 B.C. or so, says people will be running fro in the end times. Knowledge will be increased. I mean, that's cool when you think about it, isn't it? And then he went on to say in verse 9 and 10, what Daniel was told. He said, go your way, Daniel. No, look, Daniel, just write this stuff. You ain't going to understand it. Go your way, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Notice that the wicked will not, are not going to understand this stuff. But the wise shall understand it. The wise are those that place their faith in Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to help them to understand it. Now here's something interesting. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. And we're going to look at chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 11. You're going to see that there's some similarity here. But first of all, I want to go back to Daniel chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, because I want to show you what, what he was showing here in Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, what um, John was told. In, in chapter 10, verse 4 of the book of Revelation, and John was told this, When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, why did God tell him not to write what the seven thunders uttered? I don't know. We get to heaven, we'll have to ask him. But we're not supposed to know what he wrote there. But the rest of the book, we're supposed to know. Do you see the contrast? We're to understand this book. We'll find out in heaven what he was, what the seventh thunder said. I'm not going to worry about it right now. All I'm going to worry about is that I adhere to what the Bible says and I obey what I know here in this Bible. Revelation is unsealed. It is the revealing. So as I said in, Rev in Daniel 12, verse 10, if you look where it says, Many, many shall be justified, made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now let's look at Revelation 22, verse 11. So Revelation 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Isn't that interesting to see that? It kind of sounds a lot like what we just read in Daniel um, chapter 12, verse 10, right? As we see here, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Now that first two bullet points, unjust and filthy, that's an unsaved sinner. Then he that is righteous and holy, that's a Christian, that's somebody that's saved. The point is, the point is here, there's a time coming when it's going to be too late to trust Christ as Savior. Obviously, if you die, that's too late, right? But when Christ comes back, that second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation uh, period, you had better made your acceptance of Christ as Savior before that. There's a time coming when it's too late. You know, people die every day and they don't plan it. I think it's extremely important to understand that there is a time coming then this is going to be too late. And that's what this point here of these uh, in Revelation 22 verse 11. First, Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, place your faith in Him right now. The point here in verse 11, your decision matters. Nobody's going to make this decision for you. You have to make it. Think this through. Tomorrow, you'll be one day older. Then a week later, you'll be a week older. Then a month, 
than a year. It all goes by so fast. Don't put this off. You and I are about to enter eternity. It could be a day later. It could be a month. It could be a year. It could be five years. But it's going to be happening. We're going to enter eternity. Without Jesus Christ, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And I don't say that to be negative. I'm telling you the truth. It's important that we know Christ as Savior. James said in chapter 1, verse 21, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now, we don't use that word superfluity anymore. It means excessive naughtiness. And receive with weakness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, died on that cross, paid for your sins, past, present, future, and he offers you everlasting life. This right here is reality. The book of Revelation is unsealed for your sake. We should wake up. We should place our faith in Christ, and we should go tell somebody else about Jesus Christ, invite him to church, whatever we can do, because there's going to come a time when this is all going to be all over. There was a song, and it's one of my favorite songs. It's titled Just As I Am. It was written by a lady named Charlotte Elliott back in the 1800s, and the first phrase or first stanza of this song says this, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Salvation is that simple. Just we're sinners. He died for that sin. We trust him as our personal Savior, and he promised you everlasting life. It's that simple. So let's go ahead and look at our last slide here. I want to read this to you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. God knows your predicament. He knows that you're a sinner. He loves you. He sent his son for you. But it says in Romans 5, verse 8 through 10, God commended his love toward us. He showed his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, he shed his blood to wash away your sins. We shall be saved from wrath through him. And then, for if when we're enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Isn't it interesting that if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, he died for you while you were a sinner. You didn't have to clean up your act at all. Some churches will tell you, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. No. As you are a sinner, just as I am, you place your faith in him, and he washed away your sins on the cross of Calvary, and he offers you everlasting life. But notice that last uh, verse here. For if when we were enemies, we were brought back to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled or made right with him, we shall be saved by his life. You know what keeps you saved? Jesus Christ. You don't do it. You can't keep yourself saved. You come just as you are. I'm going to show you just a little illustration here real quick and we'll be closed. But let this hand represent um, you and I. Let this hand represent God. Okay? So the problem is our sins separate us from God, don't they? We, you, you may have a, less sins than me. You have, may have more sins than me. But we all have sins and that separates us from God. But what did God do? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to this earth, took our sins upon himself, died for him, paid for our sins, and now all he asks you to do is just believe that he did it for you, that he paid for your sins. And if you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he promises you everlasting life. Everlasting life is everlasting life. It's that simple. Don't let anybody make this complicated for you. It's simple. The only way you're going to get to heaven is through the cross, by trusting Christ as your personal Savior. He paid for all your sins, past, present, and future. He loves you, and he just wants you to say, I believe you did this for me. If you're here today, and you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you want to do that in the quietness of your mind, let God know I'm a sinner, and I'm trusting him as personal Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this um, church, that we can come here and worship here together. Thank you we can sing together. All the things that we do here at this church that we offer for each other, as a family and as we love each other and care for each other, we thank you and we always want to be so thankful for what you did. This Thanksgiving, we want to be thankful for so many things in our lives, for our families, uh, for our friends, for everything that we have that you've given to us. But we truly want to be thankful for what you did when you died on the cross and washed away our sins. And you offer us everlasting life so free. And it's just a matter of us saying, Lord, I believe you died for me. And if you've done that, he promises you everlasting life at that split second. Lord, pray now that we'll have a great afternoon and a great Thanksgiving coming up this week. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our last song is going to be Holy, Holy, Holy. 
let's sing this and afterwards enjoy yourself with some of the uh, food we have and refreshments. And thank you so much for coming today.